Okay, th well, th th thank you very much. Um, right, I'm going to talk, uh, as you can see, because you've got the handout, on scientific rationality and global warming. And what I really want to do is um, to um, see how the discussion that, that um, has emerged on the rationality of science within, I suppose, um, Anglo-American philosophy of science, how that bears on the question of global warming and climate change. So, so the first half of this um, talk will be really just going over some um, positions in um, the philosophy of science, wh which were much discussed um, in the 1970s and 1980s, and perhaps have, to some extent fallen out of interest more lately. But I think that they do have um, a bearing on the whole question of the science of climate change. So I want to see how um, s some themes in the philosophy of science might or might not throw light on the contemporary discussion of climate change. Now, to, to go to the uh, philosophy of science first, um, the, the basic assumption in the um, discussion which I'm going to um, rehearse um, is the pretty obvious point that science is um, a highly influential practice. Indeed, it's probably the most influential practice there is in the modern world. And it's quite clear that, uh, at least it seems to me to be clear, um, and I'm certainly not going to deny this, that, that knowledge grows in science. Um, knowledge has grown extensively in science since the 17th century, since the 20th century. And if we go back further, obviously, we can say that we know a lot more about a lot of scientific things than Aristotle did, um, who, who was, in his own way, um, a scientist. But, but we think, and think rightly, that, that we know a lot more and a lot better on many points than Aristotle. So the, it's become... A, a question, how to explain this growth of knowledge? What is it that scientists do or have been doing in more recent centuries to allow knowledge to grow in the way that it does? Well, one answer, um, which might, might seem plausible, is um, that knowledge grows in science because in science we find discoveries or scientists find discoveries which can then be justified by observation and evidence and testing. So um, science consists on this view of knowledge which is justified, justified by the methods of science and which we can therefore um, rely on. This is what I call justificationism. Now, th this view has come under um, considerable attack um, for, uh, under philosophical investigation, principally, I think, actually with um, David Hume in the 18th century, because Hume pointed out that um, the fact that we have got a lot of um, evidence to show that a particular idea is, is uh, corroborated or confirmed up to now does not show that that idea is true because it might be shown to be false um, tomorrow or you know, in, in, in the future sometime. Uh, science aims at general truths which um, apply throughout space and time. And of course, the evidence we've got at any point is only a very partial amount of evidence compared to all, all the things that, that we don't know. And this problem which Hume is pointing to is, is often called the problem of induction. So how do we know that past success is a guide to future success? The answer, of course, is that we don't and can't know that. Um, and when we look into the history of science, um, what we find is that 
Uh, many theories, which have been, had plenty of success in their day, have later on been shown to be false. And one could even say, as Karl Popper, one of my um, one of the three philosophers I'm going to um, consider, that it's easy to find confirmations in science. But that doesn't show that the theory is true. Confirmations can mislead. And Popper is particularly thinking, when he discusses this, of the transition from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics um, in the first part of the 20th century. Now, the point about Newton is that, that Newton, or one of the points, is, is that Newton, uh, of course, was the most successful scientist that's ever lived, I think I'm right in saying. Well, we can discuss that. But certainly, f for 200 years or more, people thought that what Newton told you was the truth. And w with good reason, but because this was a highly successful bunch of theories that, that he proposed, and they were continually being confirmed and leading to new discoveries. All, all these points are important. But that did not mean that it was true, that Newton's theories were true. And uh, Popper, to use his own um, autobiographical account, um, says that in 1919, when, if you can believe this, he was 17 in Vienna, um, he noticed that there was this expedition by Eddington um, to, to, to the south, southern hemisphere to, to test some of Newton's theories, which were only testable then because of a, an eclipse of the sun. And according to Popper, um, Einstein said that if Eddington's theory, sorry, if Eddington's observations had gone against him, then he would have given up his theory. Einstein said that, according to Popper. Of course, they didn't go against Einstein, they went against Newton. And that was, as the story goes, a crucial moment in the transition from Einsteinian physics um, to, sorry, from, from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian relativity. So Popper presents the idea that what is important in science is not piling up confirmations, of which millions probably had been piled up in favour of Newton, but nevertheless, at the end of the day, it availed nothing, and it was regarded as false, um, and um, Einstein's theories then became um, paramount. So a key point in the Popperian story is the crucial falsifying instance, what Popper calls a refutation. And the idea is that good scientists, like Einstein, um, who is, of course, for Popper the paradigm of a scientist, oh, I shouldn't have used the word paradigm, the model of a scientist um, uh, would have given up his theories if, if um, you know, Eddington's um, um, observations had proved him wrong. So this is what, what has come to be called falsificationism. I'm going to qualify this shortly. Um, taken for a very different purpose. The second vanished with the general theory of relativity, after a crisis, it had had no role in creating. So Kuhn is pointing out what, what Popper actually knew, and, but he should have, in a way, made more of it at the time, that actually, as well as lots of confirmations of Newtonian theory for most of the 19th century and probably before, certainly for the most of the 19th century, there were well-known what Kuhn calls anomalies to Newtonian theory, what Popper might have called falsifying instances. But, of course, the scientists in the 19th century did not give up uh, Newtonian physics. In Kuhn's terms, they lived with these anomalies, one of which was this um, orbit of Mercury, until a new theory <coughs> which dispenses with the difficulties. But the old theory is never decisively demolished. This is, this is in, in Kuhn's picture. And Kuhn then starts talking about paradigms, which are core theories, like Newton's, which scientists hold on to for decades or even centuries if they're pr proving 
successful in, in various ways which we will come on to. Um, the paradigm then makes all kinds of, or, or as a, on the basis of the paradigm, all kinds of predictions and observations are, are made. And most of these are probably going to be confirmed. Some will be not confirmed, uh, and you, you will know that, that some of it, some, so there are some inconsistencies and some anomalies, but, but you just live with that. You hold on to the paradigm. You, can, you continue working with it, um, according to Kuhn, so long as it's successful and until um, a new paradigm comes up. So in the Kuhnian picture, you had the Newtonian paradigm, which, which as I said, lasted for over 200 years. Then this was replaced by the Einsteinian paradigm on the basis of some uh, crucial um, evidence that sort of decided between them, but, but it was never, according to Kuhn, conclusive. It was just that the scientists in the 1910s, 1920s decided because of, well, for, for reasons which we will come on to, to move on to the Einsteinian picture. Kuhn also holds a more extreme view um, that if you've got two competing paradigms um, giving you different pictures of, of the world that's being investigated, the particular bit of the world that's being investigated, um, they are not, strictly speaking, comparable. They're incommensurable. Um, and Kuhn says in another quotation from um, The Structure of the Scientific Revolution, um, so, plural, since remote antiquity, most people had seen one or another heavy body swinging back and forth on a string or chain until it finally comes to rest. To the Aristotelians, who believe that a heavy body is moved by its own nature from a higher position to a state of natural rest at a lower one, the swinging body was simply falling with difficulty. Constrained by the chain, it could achieve rest at its low point only after a tortuous motion and considerable time. Galileo, on the other hand, looked at the swinging body, saw a pendulum, a body that almost succeeded in repeating the same motion over and over again ad infinitum. So Kuhn's point is that um, Einstein, sorry, that Galileo and Aristotle, when they looked at this body that we call a pendulum, they were actually seeing different things and therefore their theories weren't really commensurable. So that's incommensurability. I'm going to come back to that. Now, the initial Popperian response to Kuhn's onslaught, um, and actually Kuhn is, all the, all the three authors I'm going to read are very readable. That, that, so they're, 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 they're good, good men, they're good people from that point of view. And Kuhn's book is brilliantly readable and probably everybody should read it. And Popper's Conjectures and Refutations, ditto. Lakatosh, I'm going to, Lakatosh Imre, I'm going to come on to in a minute. Um, he is also readable. Anyway, the initial Popperian response was that Kuhn says that most of the time scientists are doing normal science. They're working within a paradigm and they're sticking to it and they're not questioning it. And that is the governing um, consensus. It's, it, it's what governs how science is practiced at the time, the paradigm. If you've got two competing paradigms, or more, more than two, you're in a period of revolutionary change. But most of, most of science, according to Kuhn, is normal science. Now, Popper's view, so all the scientific community, or the majority of them, vast majority of them, acting under a given paradigm. Popper's initial response to this is that normal science, he, he doesn't deny that it occurs, but he says it's bad science. Um, because what it means is that scientists are not taking um, counter-evidence seriously enough. Popper likes what I put here, permanent revolution and uh, always severe testing and replacement of theories. Now, one might think, um, although lots of scientists admired Popper, um, that uh, they admired him because he, he stressed the imaginative activity that was involved in, in science. And he was also a philosopher who seemed to know what he was talking about. Um, but if you take Popper seriously, really seriously, then what he's saying is that, that you have scientific theories which have a, a certain time of, of success, but in the end 
they're refuted and another theory comes on until that's refuted and another theory until that's refuted. Does this mean, then, that the history of science on a Popperian view is simply a history of failed theories, you know, moving on from one to another? And this is where Lakatos Imre, or Imre Lakatos, comes in, because in a very influential article um, called uh, Falsification and the Methodology of Scientific Research Programmes, in this book edited by Lakatos and Musgrave called Criticism and the Growth of Knowledge, Lakatos introduces what he calls the methodology of scientific research programmes, in which he tries, I think in a way, to reconcile Kuhn and Popper. This wasn't actually a very happy attempt at a marriage, and there were lots of other things I could say about Lakatos, but won't for the moment. Um, Kuhn, um, sorry, Lakatos, um, who, who was, of course, Hungarian and, and came to London in the 1950s and worked with Popper at the London School of Economics, so he was a colleague of Popper's, although they had a very bad falling out. Um, and Lakatos then died. Um, Lakatos agrees with Kuhn and also, in fact, with Popper, if you read the fine print of Popper, that no refutation is ever logically decisive. So Popper was never a naive falsificationist, in fact, despite what, what um, people might have thought. It's always possible to explain refutations away, and I stress always, either by questioning the evidence. So if you've got a theory that makes a prediction, then the theory is making a prediction. The prediction is leading to an observation. But in most science, it's quite possible to question the observations, because most observations are themselves highly theory-laden. And um, it can be a sensible thing to do. And I put here an example that, you know, everybody says that, that, that Galileo um, confirmed um, Copernicus and, uh, and showed that the Earth was going around the sun and that the solar system wasn't as... as had been thought because Jupiter had moons. Well, okay, Jupiter had moons. Galileo looked at, through his telescope and saw some moons. Well, did he? Um, you know, the, the, the technology of telescopes was extremely primitive. Um, probably there were all kinds of defects on the glass. You, you could very you know, sensibly question Galileo's telescopes if you want to. So perhaps Jupiter's moons were instrumental artifacts. And of course, the, this questionability of, of evidence is, is something which, which can be a, a real, um, a, a genuine argument in, in a scientific um, moment. Um, so, so the first thing is, if you've got a, a, a falsifying evidence, you can question the evidence itself, and that isn't necessarily a, a bad thing to do. Or, or secondly, yeah, there are actually more things you can do, I'm only going to mention two. Secondly, you can try to explain the counter-evidence away. Now, a famous example was um, the, disco the discovery of the planet Neptune. Astronomers have known for ages that, that, the, that the planet um, Uranus, was its orbit wasn't, wasn't correct according to Newtonian principles. Well, actually it was. But, but, but according to what they thought, it wasn't correct. Um, it, it was... Um, Anomalous. So, actually, two people independently proposed in the beginning of the 19th century that what was causing the irregular or apparently irregular orbit of Uranus was the interference of another as yet undiscovered planet that, that was pulling it out of, out of its, its, its proper orbit. And then they made predictions. They predicted where this planet might be seen they looked at them with more reliable um, telescopes than Galileo had, and they discovered Neptune. So there was a, a bit of falsifying evidence um, explained away in a way that was actually a triumphant vindication of Newton. Far from being a refutation of Newton's theories, it was a tri triumphant vindication. And I put in the handout, thus far so good. Brilliant. But then we, we already mentioned Mercury. Mercury's orbit was, was irregular too. Okay, so what do we do? 
We say there's another planet in between Mercury and the Sun, Vulcan. They even gave it a name. Vulcan. Was the Vulcan, was the hell? Did it matter? No. I mean, th th there might have been other, other e e explanations. Um, they just carried on um, as, as actually, uh, you know, I, the bit from Kuhn that I quoted. Um, uh, it, it, it became, the irregular orbit of Mercury became important when it was a sort of deciding instant, instance between Newton and Einstein. But until then, uh, they, they just lived with it. Does it matter? No, it didn't in practice. Now, Lakatos says this. Um, uh, yeah, th thus he talks about the relative autonomy of theoretical science. So, you know, the, on the original Popperian view, you've got theoretical science being severely controlled by observations, by um, concrete evidence. Lakatos, by contrast, talks about the relative autonomy of theoretical science, a historical fact whose rationality cannot be explained by earlier falsificationists. Which problem scientists working in research programs rationally choose, Lakatos talks about research programs where Kuhn talked about paradigms, which, pro which problem scientists working in powerful research programs rationally choose is determined by what he calls the positive heuristic of the program, rather than by psychologically worrying or technologically urgent anomalies. The anomalies are listed, but shoved aside in the hope that they will turn in due course into corroborations of the program. Only those scientists have to rivet their attention on anomalies who are either engaged in trial and error exercises or who work in a degenerating phase of research program when the positive heuristic runs out of steam. All this, of course, must sound repugnant to naive falsificationists who once held that a theory is refuted by experiment, by their rule book. It is irrational to develop it further. One has to replace the old refuted theory by a new unrefuted one. So Lakatos is talking about the relative autonomy of theoretical science and, in a way, the unimportance of counter-evidence. What he says is you should be looking for research programs, or in Kuhn's terms, paradigms, that lead to increasing discoveries, more and more discoveries, um, and have what he calls positive heuristic power. Now, this sounds very good. Um, so so we, we want to have paradigms or research programs that continually produce more corroborating evidence. It's looking a bit like justificationism now, isn't it? You see all this goes round and round in circles. Well, it sounds good. We'll move on to the next bit of the handout. But Lakatos, he talks about um, uh, problem shifts in, in a research programme, and he talks about positive problem shifts and degenerating problem shifts content increasing problem shifts. But he says that whether a, a particular paradigm is having content increasing problem shifts or not is often recognizable only with hindsight. And I put, I've sort of added there long hindsight. Um, he says this um, on page, uh, on, well, it says this. Um, Scientists do not, of course, always judge heuristic situations correctly. There are no such things as crucial experiments, at least not if these are meant to be experiments which can instantly overthrow a research programme. In fact, when one research programme suffers defeat and is superseded by another, we may, now this is the point, with long hindsight, and he's put that in italics, call an experiment crucial if it turns out to have provided a spectacular corroborating instance for the victorious programme and a failure for the defeated one. Uh, but, a, but then he goes on, a rash scientist may claim that his experiment defeats a programme and parts of the scientific community, we're getting into sociology here, may even rashly accept his claim. 
But if a scientist in the defeated camp puts forward a few years later a scientific explanation of the allegedly crucial experiment within or consistent with the allegedly defeated program, the honorific title may be withdrawn and the crucial experiment may turn from a defeat into a new victory for the program, the one that was previously regarded as having been defeated. Now, I'm going to move on to what I call scientism, just going on a little bit further before I come, we come to global warming. Scientism seems to me where scientists or scientists step outside science's proper realm and draw religious, metaphysical, ethical and political conclusions which go beyond what, what their science um, legitimates. I think also a degree of scepticism over large and all-embracing scientific theories, for example, the many worlds hypothesis of quantum theory, which of course is very fashionable at the moment, but do you really believe that every time a, a quantum particle jumps in a different way, another universe suddenly springs into existence in which it jumped the other way? Well, maybe you do, but I say go tell it to the Marines, quite frankly. Um, dark matter. You know, I, I mean, I, I, so it seems to me that a degree of scepticism about what scientists tell us sometimes is maybe sensible. Certainly the say-so of scientists, even a consensus of them, is not enough. And I just point out that Einstein himself always rejected quantum mechanics. He was never happy. As Popper puts it, Popper could be funny, um, could be amusing. Uh, you may not recognise this quotation, but something is rotten in the state of Denmark, which is from Hamlet, um, which indeed it was. But of course, Denmark was where quantum theory was um, sort of uh, most developed in the early days. So something is rotten in the state of Denmark. That's what Popper and Einstein thought about quantum theory. However, there's clearly been great progress in modern physics on the measurement and prediction of data, and that's the problem with quantum theory. Even though it's intellectually incoherent, um, it, it produces incredibly precise predictions, which you, know, you, can't, you can't deny, and you've got to take something of it seriously, but quite what um, is, is, I think, open to question. So there's clearly been great progress in modern physics even in quantum, well, particularly in quantum theory, on the measurement and prediction of data and a very high degree of prediction. So all this is, is very, very impressive. So much for all of that, and I've gone on far too long. Do, does any of this, uh, any of these reflections on uh, scientific um, rationality bear on the current debate on global warming? So I'm coming on to the, um, my second question. Well, this is from a paper, a newspaper, Sunday Times, two weeks ago. It says here, just 16 years to avo avoid carbon, carbon calamity, say experts. And th it's referring to the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change um, uh, report and um, commenting comments on it from various scientists such as Professor Dame Julia Slingo. Um, and this is what we're given in the Sunday Times. A typical newspaper story, actually from November 2014. However, the first point I would make is, if, if um, uh, astronomers told us that an asteroid was going to crash into the Earth in 16 years, I think we would take that a bit more seriously than, than that, and probably for good reason, which, which I'm going to um, explain. The headline seems to me to be going way beyond, and maybe Professor Dame Julia wouldn't quite agree with the headline, but the headline appears to be going way beyond anything legitimated by science. What's happening is that ethical and p political imperatives drawn from computer modelling about the medium to long-term future of the planet are being um, drawn. But note, the no account this of human innovation or adaptability. Now, the claim is that if carbon emissions are not cut drastically by 2100, 
the world will have warmed so much as to cause catastrophic effects. There will be a tipping point in the climate which will cause sea levels to rise unsustainably, with polar ice caps melting. There will be crop failures resulting food shortages. Fresh water supplies will collapse. And there will be millions of deaths through increase of diseases such as malaria and unbearable warming. These phenomena will result in starvation, mass migration from the warmed areas of an unsustainable nature, global war, wars and general unrest. And in Britain, following general European trends, we've undertaken to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050 and by 34% in 2020 by the Climate Change Act of 2008, was it? Yeah, um, and um, uh, Dale Jameson, who's a well-known American philosopher who writes on these matters, um, says in, about all of this that um, th this is the, the most difficult challenge in addressing climate change is that evolution did not design us to solve or even recognize this kind of problem. We have a strong bias towards dramatic movements of middle-sized objects that can be vi visually perceived, and climate change does not typically present in this way. He goes on, we live in a society in which there is a cultural chasm between scientists and policymakers. Most of us, including scientists, are largely confused about the relations between facts and values, science and policy. Um, and this has occurred against the background of rising cynicism. Making things worse, c climate change presents us with the largest collective action problem that humanity ha has ever faced. So that's a fairly typical kind of reaction. So, what does the science actually say? First, even leaving aside the unknowable effects of human innovation, which I'm going to come on to, the predictions produced by the climatologists are not like those of quantum mechanics or of any other hard science, such as the one that will predict an oncoming asteroid if there were such a thing. They are based on groups of computer models, all of which contain variations within themselves, and which overall produce different predictions of the extent of future warming, typically between 1.5 degrees centigrade and 4.8 degrees of warming up to 2100. And the most recent of the four models of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, seem to predict between 0.3 to 0.7 degrees of warming from 2016 to 35. But the first point to make, an obvious point, is a computer model is not itself evidence. It's at most a prediction which needs to be tested. But which group of models and which model within the group? Hard science does not leave us with such uncertainties. Indeed, there is a suspicion in this area that uncertainty over the future of climate is being presented as certain risk. Of course, there is uncertainty and there may be risks. And I'm not denying that there is warming. But I, I want to know something a bit more definite than, than what we're being told. Secondly, second point, different point, warming was predicted for the period 2014, sorry, 2000, 2014. But it has not occurred or occurred only very marginally. A figure of 0 0.005 degrees per decade is mentioned in the latest IPCC report based on readings from 1998 to 2012, but that was certainly less than the 0 0.3 degrees the British Meteorological Office predicted for 2004 to 14. So even if you accept the pessimistic um, predictions of the IPCC report, um, they admit that um, the warming has slowed down very considerably this century because many people say there's been no warming at all. Now, this is admitted by the climatologists, but we're warned off with the caveat that short-term blips are to be expected. 
Well, fair enough. But how short is short? When does a blip become an anomaly, an anomaly a refutation? To go back to Lakatosh and my, those people, a lot of hindsight, I think, is being called for at this point. Thirdly, according to the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it is highly likely that anthropogenic forces, that's things produced by us, especially carbon dioxide emissions, CO2 emissions, account for more than half the global warming we've experienced in recent decades. Highly likely. Um, it's all quite vague. We can agree that CO2 emissions are increasing and have increased by up to 40% since pre-industrial times and they're rising sharply still. And B, that this may have affected rises in temperature. But CO2 emissions have gone on rising uh, since 2000. So how is that consistent with the current blip in warming? More study of the relationship between CO2 emissions and warming is needed. Uh, fourthly, fourth point, um, the, the melting of the polar ice caps is, is another big element of, of the climate change debate. Well, it is true that Arctic sea ice has decreased, has, sorry, yes, has decreased since 1972, but ice in the Antarctic has increased. So the picture, again, isn't, isn't clear, and that, to be fair, is noted in the latest IPCC report. Fifthly, malaria is not caused by temperature rises, despite what many people have said. It's caused mainly by lack of medical resources due to poverty. Well, actually, it's caused by mosquitoes, but anyway. Um, but, but it could be cured by um, medical resources. It could be wiped out, as it has been in, in Europe. Uh, sixthly, and more generally, in, in the, all this debate, climate change has now, or the term climate change, has replaced the term global warming. Actually, this is sensible. I'll go along with this. The 20th century was not a period of uninterrupted warming, but of increase in temperature from 1920 to 1940, after no real change from 1900 to 20, then a cooling from 1940 to 1975, then warming from 1975 to 2000, and then either a slowdown or a stop since, making a total rise of 0.7 degrees over the whole century, the 20th century. But the fears mentioned earlier will be brought out, brought about rather, by a warming of more than two degrees by 2100. So that's what we're supposed to be worrying about. So climate change is not enough to motivate the measures we are told are required. It must be warming. You know, we don't have to worry necessarily about climate change. It must be global warming, and a warming, even a warming of 0.05 degrees per decade, will, as far as I can work it out, only produce a warming of 0.45 degrees by 2100. That's rather lower than 2%. So the, these are just questions that, that occur to me um, looking at this material. So now, uh, th these are some, or oh, I put questions, but some points that seem to me to arise from the current state of the global warming debate. Does all this uncertainty mean that gl the global warming hypothesis, as opposed to the climate change hypothesis, is not scientific? Maybe not per se. Kuhn and Lakatosh underline the uncertainty involved in establishing scientific rationality. However, one can say that confidence in global warming is not actually bolstered by the 15-year or so blip or the variations in the computer models and lack of precise and specific predictions. Further, it's not clear that the global warming hypothesis is based on some overarching explanatory paradigm, as in physics, as opposed to a conglomeration of insights and consequences derived from different branches of science. Maybe... I simply raise this as a question. What we have here is a case of a degenerating research program or a content-decreasing problem shift um, in Lakatosh's terms. 
though it's not clear what or where its competitors might be. Now the consensus point. We're often told that 97% or some such figure of scientists all agree with whatever it is that we're being told. This 97% has been questioned, um, probably with some reason, but I think it's irrelevant. Uh, the question in science is not the solidity of the consensus at any point, but the openness to differences of view and the way in which anomalies are handled. Peer review and funding mechanisms, which are often um, mentioned as, as support for um, the, the climate change, um, the people who think there's going to be global warming, they're often given as, as a reason for accepting what is being said, but actually peer review and funding mechanisms could be, as I and I think Lakatos was implying, um, simply ways of reinforcing dogma. And it is clear that dissent is not popular in this area. Maybe science generally is more, could I say, Stalinist, um, than one likes to admit, science in general. I mean, I, I don't know what, what in, in chance people writing in physics have for presenting dissenting views in peer-reviewed journals. M maybe it's good, maybe it's not, I don't know. Um, may, but so maybe, maybe um, dislike of dissent is more general in science than one likes to admit. But I think we have to suspect that what needs explaining is in the climate change area is the nature and cause of the scientific consensus. In any case, it's a very bad argument to be told that we have to accept something because of a consensus. In science, things are supposed to be the other way around. The, the consensus is supposed to come about because you can point independently to, to what is um, uh, justifying the consensus. I think thirdly, in a lot of this discussion, there is a blurring of the fact-value distinction. And when I was um, working on the philosophy of science, I, I defended uh, scientists against critics who say that they should be wary of what they should investigate. Um, for example, nuclear physics, biotechnology, whatever you like, on the grounds that their discoveries will be misused. So I'm saying there is a distinction between fact and value. And I'm defending scientists and the freedom, their freedom to research. Um, it's not the scientists who are going to order and deploy nuclear weapons, etc. Um, but politicians and decision makers, I argued. Well, I think the same point needs to be made here, but in reverse. Scientists are going beyond their brief and beyond the fact-value distinction in using their scientific credentials to drive policy? It's a separate question. But let me give you an example, two examples of, of scientists who, I think, go beyond their credentials um, in, in this area. Um, Hansen writes that the science demands a simple rule. Coal use must be prohibited. And Schneider to whom the latest IPCC report was dedicated, because he died recently, said um, that he values equity and avoiding irreversible changes in the Earth system, and there he stops. So I think that many, or some scientists who've been influential in this area, draw almost immediately um, policy conclusions from the facts, or what they take to be the facts. Um, and the philosopher Dale Jameson, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, says that we need, in fact, to develop a new system of ethics, even, beyond anything our biology and traditions have prepared us for in order to deal with this, 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 this problem. Um, okay. Well, let's assume... This is my fourth question or point. Let's assume that the warming prediction is correct and that other things being equal, and it may be correct for all I know, um, 
that we are heading for a warming of two plus degrees by 2100. What should we do now? Would doing what is recommended, that is a massive cut in global carbon emissions now, be required or even sensible, leaving aside the point that there isn't the slightest chance of this happening because of the attitude of China, India and probably of the USA, but even leaving that aside. Now, we now come to what I think is the question of justice, which I think is often lurking in the background of these discussions. Justice to future generations or justice to present generations. We are told by those who tell us we must cut carbon emissions now that we owe it to future generations to cut emissions now because their lives will be irreparably damaged unless we act now. And there are technical discussions which I've tried to get my head around, but to be honest, I find it quite difficult, about the amount of discounting we should make for future generations in these calculations. Low discount, say, the advocates of rad radical policies. But leaving this aside, however we discount the amount we should count future generations into our calculations, a severe cut in emissions now will irreparably damage the lives and prospects of millions now in China, India and other parts of the developing world. What in effect we are being asked to do is to deprive millions of people now living of the prospects of better lives for a future 80 plus years ahead and we cannot possibly know about that with any certainty. And on this point, it's not just that morality begins at home, so to speak, and I agree here with, with Jameson, who says our morality is, is, has been developed to, to fit us to, in the world in which we live and, and when we should take more care of those close to us than those far away. And I'm, I think Hume would, would agree with that. So I agree that our morality tells us to focus on you know, the people I know, the people here. But I draw the opposite conclusion from Jameson. None of the climate change models we are currently working with take into account the unpredictable... Further, none of the climate change models we are currently working with take into account unpredictable changes in technology which, they will, which there, there will undoubtedly be. So we're being asked to sacrifice the life chances of people now for people very far distant, generations different, distant, 80 or more years ahead, and without taking into account the fact that none of us sitting around here can have the faintest idea what changes in technology there will have been in 20 years or 40 or 60 or 80. And this, this is actually a Popper's best argument, in my opinion, in the poverty of historicism against um, historical determinism, that the future is always going to be very strongly affected by changes in science and technology, um, which we cannot now know. If we could know them now, we would be able to make them, but we don't know them now. And as we can't know them now, we can't know what the future will be. Who 20 years ago could ever have predicted the impact of um, computing, social media, and all that stuff? We don't even understand it now. So we, we can't know what's ha going to happen or what, what the situation is going to be in 80 years. And that suggests to me, in, in a very big way, we can't know it because human technology will have a huge impact on it. But this suggests to me that we should be extremely cautious in adopting policies which will undoubtedly change, sorry, which will undoubtedly damage people now and not just in the third world. I mean, if, if, if what our government in Britain is, is um, proposing actually takes place, heating bills will, will increase so dramatically that many people will probably die of cold um, in the 2020s. That's more or less right, isn't it, Jerry? Um, but we're being asked to do these things so as to mitigate damage in a distant future that we can know little about. 
Indeed, in my opinion, acting in this way would actually be immoral, a new version of Marxism-Leninism, which I'm sure I don't need to mention to people here, sacrificing people now for a future only we, that is the scientific vanguard, really understand. Finally, before I sum up, is the global warming is global warming necessarily bad? And even if it were, is it the worst problem facing us so as to justify the single-minded uprooting of our current ways of life? The second question is rarely addressed by the scientists, so it's obviously one which policymakers are confronted with. You know, is it the biggest problem confronting us? As to the first, I mean, maybe um, Ebola is a bigger problem. Maybe a nuclear war in Pakistan is a bigger problem. You know, there might be lots of bigger problems. Um, but I'm going to leave those aside. But as to the first, is global warming necessarily bad? What is being predicted is a gradual warming over 80 years or so. We could surely envisage adaptation to this through such measures as sea flood defence programmes, better management of water resources, increasing air conditioning, better infrastructures, a more world trade to relieve the dreadful poverty in which many still live even today, and selective plant breeding to deal with climactic changes. In any case, warming isn't all bad. It will actually lead to fewer deaths in the winter, even if some more in the summers. It will lead to lower energy costs and consumption, better agricultural yields, precisely because of more carbon dioxide, which is actually not a pollutant, but essential to life on Earth, and more rainfall in deserts. It's also noteworthy that because of increasing prosperity and um, adaptive resilient measures since the 1920s, deaths from droughts, floods and storms have massively decreased. None of these factors seems to be, to be taken into account by those who seek to alarm us. Global warming then and the tactics of its proponents, whether scientists or not, looks to me much more like a political campaign than one that's justified on scientific grounds. It's internationalist seeking to reduce the global influence and prosperity of nation states in the face of a global threat. It's ab absolutist, brooking no compromise or negotiation. It rides roughshod over other interests, for example, for food, for power. It sacrifices the present for an unknowable future. It discounts the benefits of warming, and it's a single-issue campaign, ignoring the rest of life and other values. And finally, by seeking to bankrupt the developed nations of the West, or of Europe, because I don't think America will have anything to do with it, by driving fuel costs up unsustainably, it will actually undermine the potential through research and development to deal with the problem to the extent there is one. To, to try to draw these rather ragged conclusions together, the proper kuhn lakatosh debate shows that scientific rationality itself is ragged, which I think ought to temper scientism and uncritical acceptance of what scientists tell us. Even by the most relaxed Lakatosian standards, however, global warming does not look strong. Furthermore, we, we need to question clearly here between the science and the policy, and the policy on climate change we are asked to adopt by the IPCC and the EU, and indeed by my government, should be questioned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.